Hey, good to see you on this beautiful summer Sunday morning. John chapter 19, we are heading towards the cross. The cross in Latin, there's this word that we use for like crucifixion. It's this word crux or cruce. And it has interestingly enough become in our culture a word that means a cross section or the point or the pinnacle. The crux of the story, the crux of the song, the crux of their life, whatever it might be. And it, so it's come to mean a really pivotal moment. And the reason that it has come to mean that is because we recognize in human history that the point, the main intersection and the cross section of the whole narrative of mankind is the cross of Jesus Christ. And so in John's gospel, one of the dangers of going week by week for 400 weeks is that we can forget the overall narrative, which is John is presenting a court case that Jesus ought to be understood as the God of the universe. He really wants you to recognize that moment where God, the almighty creator of everything, Colossians chapter one says, through him and to him and for him are all things, John one, Jesus has made everything, He has made it perfect in its time, and so when Jesus condescends and becomes man and puts on another nature along with his deity, He's putting on a suit of mankind and it's now a, it's foreign to him, right? It's, it's now bound by things like, like being tired and hungry and uh, he's, he's tempted. And so all these things are new, new experiences. And now we find the crux of the life of Jesus here in chapter 19 as he's walking towards the cross. Here's what it says. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. History tells us there's three different kinds of flogging. Uh, the first one is fustig fustigatio, which is basically a, um, it, it's probably a little bit more exemplary, demonstrative. You, you take off someone's clothes, you whip them with a stick a few times. Not that it would be pleasant for sure, but this is not really the scourging that we see maybe in the Passion of the Christ as it were. The second one is uh, where we get the word like uh, self-flagellation when people whip themselves in different sorts of tribes or cults. So uh, flagellatio, which is a little bit more intense of a beating. Um, and then there's this, the last one, which is verberatio. And this one is a death sentence. So the verberatio word is when someone is scourged like this, there's a good chance they don't make it out. Okay, so this was the same thing for a lot of people as being uh, an executionary measure. What we see right here, some people will argue that John's gospel and Matthew's gospel, because here John chapter 19 says that Jesus was flogged before his trial with Pilate here, and then the book of Matthew chapter 27 says it's after. A really simple way of understanding those two things in the original language is to recognize that they're two different floggings. The first one, here's Pilate giving him the fust fustigatio, which is basically give him a couple lashes and let's see if this appeases the Jews. Remember, Pilate wants nothing to do with Jesus. So he says, here's what we'll do. We'll make a public spectacle. We'll smack him a couple times. We'll embarrass him. We'll put a robe on him that he doesn't want to wear, probably a rug or a doormat that's scarlet or purple, and we'll slap him in the face a few times. And then we'll kind of make fun of the Jews too because this is your king. This dude is your king. This is the best y'all can do. And maybe the Jews will go, that's it. That was good. Thank you so much. Let him go. So Pilate's hopeful that a very light scourging, which is a little bit, <laughs> it's kind of a funny way of putting it, right? A light scourging, you know, like you do. It's uh, in the middle of that, he's hopeful that they're gonna say that's sufficient. He had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns. These are po probably from a date palm where the thorns are up to 12 inches long. So don't think little thorn bushes, think digging into the skull and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him. This is the imperfect in the Greek. Again and again and again. They kept on going up to him. They probably sat him on some sort of a rock or a stool. And they put a robe around him and then they would slap him and smack him and spit on him. And it says they use a stick to, because the crown keeps falling off. So they use a stick to hammer it into his head. So it's digging into his skin. Hail king of the Jews. And they slapped him in the face. That again is in the imperfect. They kept slapping him in the face. So Pilate comes out and says to the Jews gathered, look, I'm bringing him out to you to let him know that I'm all done, right? I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, here is the man. This is an important phrase. In the Latin, it's eki homo, this is eki homo, which means this is the man, or behold the man. 
And while it can be really easy to jump over this, when we're talking about the crux of human history, we also need to recognize that from the very beginning of the Bible, in doing a little bit of an overview, there are two competing tensions. This is extremely important for the story of Jesus. We're gonna walk the Old Testament all the way to the cross, living in these two tensions. The first tension is the law of God, the justice of God, the wrath of God. God the Father being bound by his character is all things perfectly, which means, yes, he loves perfectly. First John 4, 7 and 8, you don't know love unless you know God because God is love. God is also mercy. He delights in the showing of mercy, Hebrews tells us. He is a God of, um, he's God that is, is, he's just in everything that he does. The Old Testament lets us know this again and again and again. And the maintenance of these things or the, the display of both of these is perfectly seen on the cross. The justice of God, the law of God, the commands of God meet the grace of God and the love of God and the heart of God on the same place. The Old Testament can be understood through these two rising tensions. If you look at it through a Lutheran lens that Luther liked to use, Martin Luther, the famous theologian, liked to use, as history is continuing, we see this increasing understanding of the inappropriate response that we've had to God's kingship, which is we have levied on ourselves the punishment, the due punishment for the penalty of sin. So the law of the Old Testament, if you're unfamiliar with it, God lays out 613 things that one man must do, that a woman must do in order to follow God perfectly. Okay, 613 things. And this isn't God coming down and going, ah, let's talk about what I like. Um, I like honesty. Let's, let's say don't lie. Um, I really like faithfulness. Let's say don't commit adultery. The law of the Old Testament is best understood as the father piecing out his character and then showing everyone what he's like. Why is murder uh, a sin? Why is murder against God's law? Because he's a God of life. God is a God of truth, so why is lying wrong? Because you're disavowing your allegiance to God. We are made, Genesis tells us, to bear the image of God and to Isaiah 43 verse seven, to display the glory of God. So when we as image bearers and glory spreaders say, look, God's a liar, look, God's a cheater, look, God's a murderer, look, God's a bigot, we are rebelling against the reason we were made and that's where sin comes into the picture. We have looked at the king of the universe and he said, here's why I made you. And we've said, no thank you. I'm king, I'm good, I'm right. I'm the captain now. We don't like what you have to say. We're gonna do things our own way. So Genesis starts to present this idea where the law comes into the picture because why? Because Adam and Eve rebelled against God. They committed mutiny, treason on a cosmic scale. And God said, I am the king of the universe, and they said, well, we kind of like our own system, and then humanity and God experienced this separation, and in that separation, all of mankind, including the human genome and the world and mountains and rivers and lakes, all became subject, uh, the book of Romans 8 tells us, to frustration, to anger. It's moving in the wrong direction, and so we see earthquakes and hurricanes and cancer and miscarriage and brokenness all over our world, down to a genetic Economics, right inside of our DNA. Everything's messed up. And as the Bible continues, in one sense, the, the story keeps getting worse. We have sinned against God, Genesis 3, 15 and 16. There's this really interesting promise that takes place that while we have sinned against God, he makes a prophecy there back in the Garden of Eden that one day there will come someone who will crush the head of death, crush the head of Satan, but in the crushing of the head of Satan, the snake will bite his heel and take his life. So back to the very beginning, people have been waiting for the fruition of this moment, for this man to show up. Who is this man? Where is he coming from? What will he be like? Will he be a king warrior like David? Will he be a powerful, wise ruler like Solomon? Will he be a great prophet like Elijah? Will he be a great priest in the line of Melchizedek? Who is this man? Who is this man? We've been waiting for him. And the Bible, in the law, continues to demonstrate that not only have we fallen short of, oh, I missed my, not only have we fallen short of God's perfect plan, 
it keeps getting worse and worse. Genesis, we messed it up. Genesis 6, God purifies the whole earth through a flood, seeing that man is naturally unrighteous, a slave to sin. How does God help us understand that we are slaves to sin? The book of Exodus is God's people in slavery. The Israelites were not enslaved because God wasn't paying attention when, it, when Egypt came by. He wasn't like, so you guys sit there, oh, darn it, there's Egypt. I no, what's he doing? He's, he's practicing the same. He's helping us recognize the natural due consequence for sin. When you, Genesis 3, rebel against God, you are gonna find a purging of things. You are gonna find the need, Genesis 22, for a child to be sacrificed Exodus, because you are bound in captivity towards your sin. If you're in, sitting in here, many of us have a history with addiction or chemical dependency. And if I told you that sin feels like addiction or slavery, you're not gonna argue with me, right? You're gonna go, amen, absolutely. That's what it feels like. And Jesus is saying, I'm trying to help you understand. The same way the Hebrews are enslaved to the Egyptians, so man is enslaved to himself, to his flesh, James tells us. It's a snare that captures us and then when fully grown, kills us. Then the Old Testament goes on to go, he has 613 laws, which are his character on full display. We have all fallen short. What do we do about that? Here comes the book of Leviticus, where all of a sudden we get this really interesting system where God says, the price for your rebellion and mutiny is bloodshed. The price for treason in a kingdom is death. The price for mutiny against Captain Barbosa and Blackbeard is you walk the plank. If you're going to try to overthrow the king, you better do it. Because if you attempt and you fail, you have sinned against the king of the universe. And we failed in our coup attempt. And now God's going, I am holy and perfect and righteous and you must understand something. God cannot in his perfect justice, turn a blind eye towards sin because then he wouldn't be just. He wouldn't be right. He wouldn't be a good judge. And these are all characteristics of God, the 613. He is always that. So how does God maintain his justice while also displaying his love, which is another part of his character? The Old Testament then continues. Here's Deuteronomy. Now we get into the prophets who start to foretell something that's going to happen. The wisdom literature. When you walk with God, you will be wise. When you walk in the world, you'll come to destruction. The book of Proverbs is a dude who married 700 people going, don't do what I did. And it continues all the way through these prophetic books where sin eats you alive like locusts. It seasons everything that you touch like yeast would. It is it's being propped up again and again that there are deadly consequences for sin and yet dripped throughout the Old Testament, here's this man again. The man from Genesis 15 is the man from Genesis 15, 6 is the man from Genesis 22 is the man from Exodus chapter three is the man from Exodus 33. There's this foretelling again and again and the prophets start to come in. Let me skip these, don't look at it, don't cheat. Here comes... Here comes Isaiah who has this, who God gives him this divine revelation of the man. Here's what this man's gonna do. The man will be tortured and killed. He was despised and rejected by mankind. He'd be a man of suffering, familiar with pain. He took upon our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So Jesus is saying, as sin increases and as the debt piles up, I will send an equally salvific substitute. You will have great iniquity, but I will send a great sacrifice. And so we're asking the question, who is this man? Where is this man? And the Bible says, here's what it's gonna be like. He's gonna be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Zechariah. Hundreds of years before Jesus shows up, if you think it best, give me my pay, but if not, keep it. So they paid me 30 pieces of silver. This is how much Jesus was betrayed by Judas for. And the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter. The money that was used to betray Jesus is actually used to purchase the potter's field, history tells us. And the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, the handsome price at which they valued me. Who's me? This is the man. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them to the potter at the house of the Lord. 
Not only will he be betrayed, he'll be mocked. The psalmist in chapter 22, a thousand years before Jesus prophesies, the man will be mocked. They will hurl insults, they will shake their heads. They're gonna say things like, look, if he's, part, if he's God, then let God rescue him. Let God deliver him since he delights in him so much. And so the Old Testament has this constant kind of trail of breadcrumbs that while sin is great, the love of Christ will be greater still. There's a man that's coming. He will pronounce an end to all of our sin. And one way of understanding that is as the law of God, the 613, the law doesn't save. It doesn't fix. It doesn't qualify. It doesn't help. If there is only law, then all we have is the same situation if you've got broccoli in your teeth. The law is like a mirror. It can show you the problem. It can't fix it, right? A wise man looks at a mirror and looks at himself and goes, I've got a problem in my teeth. And a fool then punches the glass, grabs a shard, and tries to pick out the broccoli with the mirror. The mirror isn't able to fix that, right? If you go to um, the doctor and they find out that you have cancer because they did a CAT scan on you, the solution to your cancer isn't more CAT scans, right? Well, we found cancer on the CAT scan. 30 more CAT scans and you'll be fine. That's not, the, that's not the solution. All the law does, the Old Testament just does one thing. It tells us we have a problem. And the 613 laws that we have all fallen so grossly short of, we know through Leviticus that it's gonna require a sacrifice and it's either gonna be me or the man. But who is this man, this suffering servant, Isaiah 53? This king who has come into flesh, born in Bethlehem, Micah 5, verse 2. Sold for silver, Zechariah chapter 9. Riding on a donkey, Zechariah 7. He's gonna pronounce war that ends all wars, Revelation tells us. Who is this man that we're waiting for? And in doing so, God presents the gospel, which is the good news, that while our sin is great and the law is huge, his grace is greater still. And at the intersection of the increase in understanding of our brokenness and sin is also the increase of his love for us. And the middle where these two meet in human history in John 19 is the crux of the matter. It's the cross. Another way of putting that, one of the most famous verses in the New Testament, the wages of sin is death. We see that increasing. We watch that it's slavery, it's sin, it's a, it's a sacrifice of blood, Leviticus tells us. It separates people one from another, but the gift of God is eternal life. Here's the tensions the Bible is hanging on. How do you resolve the tension? How do you resolve the wages of sin is death, but God has this free gift? He says there's gonna be a man. Who is this man? Then we get further, the justice of God demands that someone be punished or else he's not a just God. But then the love of God provides. And the cross is the perfect crux of God demanding justice but providing love, providing propitiation, providing a substitute, providing a way out. Where our sin was great, his love is deeper still. This is the heart of the matter. This is John 19. It's where his perfect justice and his perfect love meet is on the cross of Jesus Christ. So we can feel this rising tension inside of the story, which leads us, like all of these things would ask, who is this man, John 19, accidentally Pilate declares, Pilate said to them, what? This is him. Here is the man. And Pilate doesn't know what he's talking about, right? He has no clue. But God speaks through donkeys in the Old Testament. He speaks through donkeys today. And he can speak through whatever means. And he consistently uses a man named Pontius Pilate, who's an apostate, against the word of God, against the means of God. Let me just give you a couple of the things that Pilate ironically, truthfully says. In 19 verse 5, he says, here is your king. In 1838, he says, this man has done nothing wrong. In 1836, you are a king then. In 1914, do I need to crucify this king? John 19, 19 through 22, this is really powerful. 
Pontius Pilate puts a sign above Jesus' head and it says, this is the king of the Jews. And the Jews say, Pilate, change the sign. Write down instead that this guy claims to be the king of the Jews. You know what Pilate says? I wrote what I wrote. Leave it there. So when Jesus is being crucified, there is a sign above his head that reads correctly, this is the king of the Jews. Shoot, it's the king of the Gentiles. It's the king of the universe. It's the king of Pilate. It's the king of the Jewish leaders. He's the king of everything. And so God is using, through his sovereign power, Pilate to make all these declarations, and you've got the Roman official who's properly understanding Jesus accidentally through irony, and the Jews are opposed to everything. This is the man. If we're willing to recognize and get rid of the irony, what we find is that he's declaring what the Old Testament has been waiting for, what we have been waiting for, what our sin pleads, what our brokenness requires, what our separation bridges. This is it. Here he is. He is Isaiah's suffering servant. He is the psalmist's pierced and transgressed ones. He is Genesis 22's propitiatory slam sacrifice. He is Genesis 3's snake crusher. He is the man. Here he is. Behold, eke homo in the Greek. Here, or in, the, in Latin. Here's the man. This is him. Truer words were never spoken. As soon as the chief priest and the officials saw him, they shouted, crucify, crucify. But Pilate answered. The pronouns here are emphasized. You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis against this man. I find no basis for these charges against him. I would propose to you that the reason that the majority of mankind will face judgment, that the scripture says, the road to heaven is narrow, and wide is the road that leads to destruction, is not because that people on earth believe that they are in a rebellious, mutiny, active, militant hatred against God. It's that most of mankind will take the route of Pilate. Most of mankind doesn't see themselves as Judas. Most of mankind would associate with Pilate. I, I didn't say crucify him. In fact, if it, was, if it was up to me, I would have nothing to do with this man. But some people crown him a king. Some people want to crucify him for being uh, a criminal and Satan himself. And what does Pilate do? He goes, I'm going to wash my hands of the situation. I just, do I need to give an answer? What we fail to recognize when we think that we are in some case at an impasse with God is we fail to recognize, as the psalmist says, that we came out of the womb as an enemy of God. That we, into iniquity was I born, the psalmist tells us in Isaiah, or in Psalm chapter 51. Romans chapter three, beginning at verse 10, there is no one right with God in their own means, not even one. No one by their own nature seeks after God. Everyone would rather breathe out poison like a snake and bite those around them. There is no one naturally good. And if no one is naturally good, we actually need something to change us, to morph us and transform us. That would, it, the argument we make about now being at an impasse with God would be likened to if you walked into my household and murdered my family, and after I found you guilty in my eyes, I saw you, you were guilty of the crime, I then walk out and meet you on the front lawn, and you go, we're cool, right? No! We're not cool. And you're like, geez, what? I haven't done anything since I murdered your family a few minutes ago. What? You're, God, this guy is so, oh, this is what this scripture is saying. It's trying to let you know. You've committed mutiny against the God of the universe. You're, you're in a position of judgment as you sit. You don't have to get there. You came out that way. What we need, Romans 5 tells us, we are naturally born enemies of God. Subjected to frustration. We need adoption to sonship, Romans 8, 15. So th the commonality that we have to recognize in the story of the crux of mankind and the point of the whole gospel and the point of the world in general is this. Here's what all people have in common. No one has gotten out of this except for one man named Jesus. We are by our nature mutinous, Okay? Think Jack Sparrow overthrowing Barbosa. Think, think about someone on a ship, like Captain Phillips, you guys remember that movie? Uh, where Tom Hanks, uh, the Somali pirates come and board his ship, 
And the most popular line of that movie is when the Somali pirate looks at Tom Hanks in the eye with an AK-47 and he says, look at me, look at me. I'm the captain now, right? I, I'm not, my accent's not so good. But <laughs> by nature of our nature, this was the first word we ever uttered before we knew language. We looked at God and we said, look at me, look at me. I'm God, you're not. I do things my way, not your way. Which is why, friend, I have a caution for you. If someone asks you how long you've been a Christian and you say, my whole life, it is not true. You have not been a Christian your whole life. In fact, this is probably why the book of Matthew chapter seven warns us very specifically, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, and his response will be, I never knew you. Why? Because you've associated being in church that your mom dragged you out of bed when you were three years old with being a Christian. And yet you've never actually looked your sin in the face, surrendered it over to Jesus, and received what he's done on your behalf. That is an important moment in the life of every Christian is the conversion of self. To give over Romans 10 and say, I confess with my mouth that you are Lord. I believe in my heart that you died to save me from death. For it is with the mouth that we confess and we, we believe and it is with our heart that we understand and we are saved. So some of us have never actually had that moment. We just think that we're gonna get in by proxy or we're gonna just, the, the theology of the man in the garage who thinks himself a car, right? Well, I've been in church long enough as if God's, you know, like, well, I didn't marry her, but I live with her for a long time, so we're technically married. That's not the, the, the important part of the marital ceremony in the life of the believer is the vow. Forsaking all others, I take you. Now, you might not remember when that happened for you, but that's very different than thinking it's never happened for you because, friend, you're a natural enemy. We must surrender. You do not surrender by proxy. You don't surrender by osmosis. You don't surrender by membership. You surrender by, Romans 10, 9 through 15, a movement of the heart and a profession of the life. We are mutinous by our nature. We are charged with blasphemy. When you watch the story of Jesus, recognize this. Everywhere else in scripture where Jesus is the hero, when he tells a parable, and it's the Good Samaritan, Jesus is the Good Samaritan. When he tells a story, Jesus is the hero. When he sees a paralyzed man, we're not Jesus. We don't see paralyzed men and tell them to walk. We don't see sinful men and tell them that their sins are forgiven. We are not Jesus. There's only one story in scripture where the Bible really wants you to relate to the character of Jesus, where you're allowed to see yourself through his lens, and that's his crucifixion. Why? Why was Jesus tried for blasphemy because that's my guilt coming out of the womb I am God you are not what is that because you this is what the the religious rulers say we charge you with blasphemy Jesus because you a man call yourself God is that true no he the God called himself God where is there a man then who calls himself God right here Who's the man who deserves the scourging? Who's the man who deserves the trial? Who's the man who's put on trial and would have a fair one and be found guilty? This guy. Who deserves to bear their own cross? Who deserves to be whipped and tortured? Who deserves the humiliation? Who deserves to be stripped naked and, and embarrassed? Me, 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 me. I can finally look at the story and go, ah, yes, I finally relate to Jesus. Why? Because he's doing what I was supposed to do. That's why the, 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 the gospel of Jesus, particularly his crucifixion, it has to move us. It's the only time you can start putting your name in there and nodding along. Then Christopher was taken before the council and he thought himself God and he wasn't. So they started to mock him and say, you think you're God? Spit on him and slapped him, humiliated him. This is my story. Then what's Jesus doing in my story? The cross is where the justice of God meets the grace of God. I can find myself finally recognizing when they were chanting for him to be crucified inappropriately, they were chanting for me to be crucified appropriately. I'm mutinous by nature. I've been charged with blasphemy and I'm guilty of it. I'm culpable in my blasphemy. I'm also complicit in morality. I don't just do bad things. I watch other people do them and I keep my mouth shut. Right? It's a famous theologian of old says, Sometimes the only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing about it. 
there's my story again, right? This story, this sermon's about me a lot. How often do I see bad happening and just avoid it? Yeah, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm both culpable. I both do it and I see it being done and keep my mouth shut. And not only that, I'm guilty by commission, the sins I commit, and I'm guilty by omission, the good that God asked me to do that I say, that's uncomfortable, or no thanks. It's every time God's called me to generosity and I've chosen selfishness. It's every time God has called me to honesty and I've chosen lies. It's every time God has called me to help someone in need and I've said, I'm too busy. I'm not just guilty for the junk I do. I'm guilty for the junk I don't do. And I'm afraid one day to get to heaven and have God not just lay out all the sins I've done, but all the good that he called me to do that I said no thanks. I don't even think I'm aware of it anymore. It's such white noise in my brain what God wants from me. And the static of my sin is so great that the Holy Spirit, it's like he's trying to run through all of this static. I'm terrified of what he asked me to do just today that I've already said, as the VeggieTales character did, I'm too busy for this. Busy, busy, dreadfully busy. I can't. I don't have time. When we start looking at this, it, it, it's so culturally appropriate for us to identify ourselves with the heroes of the story, and the only time we're allowed to present ourselves as the hero is when the hero is on trial for the sin that I committed. By commission and omission, my life is the evidence. What, maybe the most haunting thing you could think about is getting to heaven and sitting in front of a perfect and holy God by which the creatures and the angels, it says all day, day and night, night and day, Isaiah chapter six, Revelation chapter 21, Revelation chapter three, Revelation chapter four. Day and night these creatures cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. When mankind finds themselves in the presence of a perfect and holy God like Isaiah six, Isaiah, who's probably the most moralistic, righteous man on earth, falls face down before God and says, burn away my impurity. He actually recognizes himself as deserving of fire-based purification. Isaiah asks for it. Purify me. Because he finally recognizes righteousness. Woe is me, he says. I'm a man of unclean lips. I come from a people of unclean lips and now my eyes have seen the king. I just imagine for a virtue signaling culture that we live in and everyone thinking that the problem is somebody else. I don't know if you guys watch the debate. It's good television. <laughs> and I asked you, just based on the debate, who's the problem with the world? <laughs> right, you, it's like every, this is the best presidency ever, this is the worst presidency ever, we have more money than ever, we have less money than ever. You're like, I don't even, <laughs> what is truth, right? It's like. I don't know. I love this is the best we could do. Um, but we are just, we virtue signal everything, right? Oh, well, if everyone was more like my people, we wouldn't have this problem. Yeah, but if everyone was more like my people, we wouldn't have this problem. And we keep doing, but then the reality of it, that Jesus takes the idea of behavior modification or behavioral righteousness and makes it a heart issue and goes, I, I don't care what you, I care what you think about what you've done. I, I care what you feel about people, not just what you say out loud. Every, every, even in the debate, it was all about, I didn't say that. No, I didn't say that. No, I didn't say that. It's, friend, did you think it? Did you feel it? If you don't say something bigoted against someone, but you feel it, Jesus goes, what difference does that make? All sin begins in the heart. I just imagine, imagine the last 36 hours of your life, your mental thoughts being played out on a reel for all of us to watch. And now imagine, I'm 35 years old, 35 years of, if I died today, a 35 year long mental reel played out in front of the holy God of the universe. <laughs> and that's just the mental one, that's not even the actual one. I wouldn't even wanna watch the real one, I'm, let alone the one that took place in my heart. And it's really great to think of ourselves as good people until we recognize that the heart is the beginning of our sinful nature. Well, I didn't do that, but friend, did you think it? Did you feel it? Did you want it? Do you covet? Do you hate? Do you lust? Do you, we all of a sudden go, well, everyone does that, right? <laughs> That's not the argument in front of a holy God. <laughs> everyone does. God's like, I didn't, and I'm your standard. My life is the evidence. <laughs> no one's gonna get to heaven and think they've got a good case. No one's gonna feel good about that court case. Like, I don't know. The verdict is guilty. And then my sentence is separation. 
Yes, it's death. It's death permanently. But it's also a fate worse than death, which is to no longer reside in the presence of the perfect, holy, just, giving, loving, good God. Forever. Which is why when Jesus is pinned to the tree and pinned to the cross, and he cries out in a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why did you leave me? Do you want to know why? Because hell demands that God separate himself from the sinner. So Jesus was separated and forsaken by the Father because that is what this guy deserved. He had to bear the full weight. The book of Hebrews uses this funny phrase. Hebrews, I think it's chapter 2. I think it's verse nine. Why did Jesus have to die such a gruesome death? The text says because it was fitting to fulfill the righteousness that the Son of God would suffer. Not just die. My sin and my rebellion didn't just deserve death. It deserved suffering, death, and separation. The perfect and holy God does justice perfectly as well. And it would have been insufficient it would have been too little. It would have, it, it, it would have failed to reach the mark of true righteous punishment for Jesus just to die at the ripe old age of 85 in his bed. He needed to suffer. He needed to be struck down in the prime of his life, not in some old age where we didn't expect him to live any. He needed to have be struck. Why? Because it, everything was robbed from him, taken from him. The guilt is more than just you die like everyone else does someday. Isaiah 53, B8, verse 12, it was the will of the Lord to crush the son. Why? Because in God's justice, I deserve to be crushed, so God had to crush his own son in my place. So what's the difference in mankind? If that's the similarity, the difference is this. Through the gospel of Jesus, the question can all of a sudden be asked, who will endure the sentence? This is new. Before this, in Genesis 3, we would have recognized immediately the fall, I deserve the punishment of separation and death. And in Genesis 3, 15, God goes, I am going to make a way that one day you'll be able to ask the question, who will endure your suffering? Who will will submit to your sentence? It doesn't have to be you. This is the gospel of Jesus. This is why the cross is perfect justice and perfect love meeting. Because I don't have to endure my own capital offense. Why? because the king of the Jews was found guilty in my place. Someone's already paid my debt for me. But in pride, in Pontius Pilatism, and in pride, we will say, "Mm, I will submit to no one. I will remain my own king. I will remain my own captain. Or, I'm not gonna do this whole captain, God thing. It's not really my thing. I just wash my hands of the whole situation. But remember the list of what we're all guilty of. That's on all of our conscious from birth. You didn't have to do it. You don't have to have an opinion about God for him to have an opinion about you. Tozer once said, the most important thing that can come to any man's mind is what he thinks about when he hears the word God. C.S. Lewis responds and says, I actually have a more important question that mankind should ask themselves. What comes to God's mind when he thinks about you? What you think about God doesn't change him. What he thinks about you changes everything. And there's options here. Why are there options? Because God demonstrates his love for us in this, Romans 5, verse 8. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Motivated by his love, he's made an option that I can in humility, Romans 10 tells me, confess with my mouth that Jesus is the king of my life. I'm not captain, he's the captain. And believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead and fulfilled what I owed. And in doing so, Romans 10 tells me, I will be saved from what? from separation, from the guilt of the mutiny, from the punishment of sin, from the stain-charged problem that I had before. I'm saved from that. And here, friend, is where I want to finish by cautioning us who have the same thought. This is the scariest verse in the Bible. Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many, scary, will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? These are all church things. Do we drive out demons and perform miracles? 
If there was someone sitting amongst you that prophesied and drove out miracles and all those things, we would go, they're for sure in. And yet, you want to know who else drove out demons and prophesied? His name was Judas. And John chapter 12 tells us he went out with the other 12. God will use broken people to do what he wants. He draws straight lines with crooked sticks because that's the only kind of sticks he can find. What's my caution? My caution is for those of us who, like your, the butt print in your seat is perfect. You were there every week. You sit in the same chair with the same ideology and the same, but there's actually not been a re- reformation of your heart. There actually, you've never looked your sin in the face and said, Lord, <laughs> I don't even know if I've ever surrendered my life to you. Because that's bigger than just attending church or signing up for the next Bible study. Lord, have I ever looked my sin square in the face and said, Lord, take this. Give me your righteousness and take my brokenness. And so that's how I want to end today. As, as a church, the most important thing that we do, Acts chapter 2, that people aware of their sin ask the question, what should I do in response to these things? The answer is you need to repent of your sin and turn to Jesus. Maybe you've been following us in the book of John. You're interested in this Jesus character. That doesn't work. Maybe you're a fan of Jesus. No one cares. When you get to heaven, the question isn't, were you a fan of him? Were you around him? It's not an intelligence test. It's not a Bible literacy test. It's a blood test. Are you a son of God? Are you a child of God? How do I become a child of God? Romans 8, 15. Those who surrender to him and cry out to him for forgiveness, all who call in the name of the Lord will be saved. And those who the Lord has set free, they are free indeed, by which we can now, 8, 15, cry out to him, Abba, Father. Friend, if you don't, if you're not a son of God or a daughter of God, by submitting to him and giving your life to him, when you sing good, good father, you're not talking to your father because you're not his kid. That adoption process happens through conversion, through saying, I am dead to my sin, now I'm alive in Christ. So maybe that's you. So I'm gonna, we're gonna end today with just a prayer and there's just a recognition of those things. You can pray it in your heart. God is listening. He's listening to your thoughts. He's listening to your prayer life. But I'm gonna lead you in this prayer. If you wanna say for the first time today, God, I I got some business to do with you. I've just been around this for so long, but I I wanna give my life to you. I'm I'm gonna ask you to pray this prayer along with me. Would you bow your heads and pray? Uh, Lord, for, for many of us sitting here, we might just be near, we might be new to this faith conversation, and yet maybe this is a new understanding to recognize that there's a point in the life of every believer where you can't just go, I've always been in church because church doesn't change anything if we haven't surrendered our life to you. It, it, it's just like putting a Band-Aid on cancer or lipstick on death. It's nothing. It's, it's, we need to surrender to you. We need your life in us. So Lord, If we've never given our life over to you or or we don't even remember, we just know that that's never been a conversation. Lord, we do that right now. So Lord, would you take away my sin? Lord, I am aware of my mutiny. I'm aware of my sin. I'm aware of your justice. I'm aware of what I deserve. I deserve death and separation. But God, I've read in your word that you are a man of promise. You are a covenantal God. And it says in the text that you gave your son that I might live. So God, I want to do what Romans 10 tells me. I I want to declare right now that you took my sin on your cross when you died and you gave me your life in its place. I recognize that when you died on that cross, you pinned my mutiny and my sin to it and then you buried it in the ground. And then you and you alone, Lord, have the power to make dead things live again. And when you came back out of the ground, you showed that the payment that I levied on you was paid in full. And God, in response to that, Romans 10 tells me, now I live that you are the God and King and Captain of my life. It's not me anymore. So God, I give you my life. I surrender completely over to you. Take my sin. Give me your life. Teach me what it is to walk with you. It doesn't mean I'm gonna be perfect, but it does mean I've got a new captain and I surrender to you. I wanna get back on track. I wanna follow you in all that I do. Lord, we pray all these things in your name. Amen.